Hello and welcome to Net That Hall. I'm back after quite a long hiatus, I think. A game week 33 matchups show. I think it's my first one since the international break, so it feels good to be back. I'm joined by my co-host Craig. You can find him on X at manonpod underscore Craig. Good to see you, buddy. Happy Wednesday. How are you getting on? Happy Wednesday. I'm quite impressed that see the stripes on my jacket match your t-shirt. This was completely unplanned, but we look like we're part, we've got some sort of like uniform on or something. I quite like it. I feel, yeah, exactly. Like maybe I can find out where you got your jacket afterwards so I can finish my ma- matching set. But um, no, you look good, man. Good to see you. It's been a while. And um, yeah, it's just nice to be back into the swing of FPL. Um, I don't think I particularly enjoyed three game weeks in one week's time. I'm kind of happy it's gone back to one every weekend with Saturday deadlines. Um, gives me a bit more time to think, to enjoy the Champions League in the midweek. But yeah, let's go straight into it today. We're going to be very quick with this one because I know you also have a hard stop today. So we don't want to obviously keep you too long. I think we'll go straight into the philosophy if that sounds good. That sound good. What we got? I'm going to so throw one at you. Yeah, let me throw a philosophy at you because obviously I don't have the guy on the toilet that Gabriel normally has, but I've gone and put it into Canva into a random uh, inspirational graphic. So this one's from Henry J. Kaiser, an American industrialist. Um, he was part of the group that built the Hoover Dam pre-World War II. He, um, he, he was part of modern uh, modernizing the healthcare system and other, other big stuff. But um, So the FPL philosophy of Game Week 33 that I've come up with from Henry J. Kaiser is live daringly, boldly, fearlessly. Taste the relish to be found in competition in having put forth the best within you. So this really reached out to me. I was looking for the philosophical quotes around competition, around sports, around competing in games with friends or rivals. And it really kind of reached out to me because I do feel that sometimes we focus on the outcome a lot. And I'm just talking about in life, not in FPL. I'll let you give your take on how you think this quote might fit into FPL. I'll give you that difficult job. But on my side, just on the non-FPL perspective, I do feel that sometimes I forget that it's about the journey and like just at the end of all this, I don't want to have regret that I didn't do things the way I wanted or to stick to my values and live life in that way. So I'd like to think that I can try and be more bold, be more fearless, do some more daring things in life. Maybe it's just middle age started to set in for me. I don't know. But how do you feel it relates to FPL? Do you think it relates to FPL? Uh, I think you can twist it. I'll use that phrase, twist it, to relate to pro- probably more to captaincy is the first thing that, that sticks out to me here that I've certainly been guilty in the past of playing it safe with captains and particularly around Harland in most of the last two seasons. We know that his EO is going to be crazy high, upwards of 150%, probably most game weeks. So there's there's been certain weeks within this time frame where I've looked at it and thought, well, I actually think this person's a better captain than Harland this week. There's weeks where Harland's played away, for example, and we look at it and think, yeah, he's got this NK fixture, but there's someone else... With a, with a better matchup, and obviously we talk about matchups a lot on this pod. Um, but just for, for safety and low risk and those sorts of things, I end up captaining Haaland anyway, he's 160% here. Um, but I think it, generally, this quote leads to the point that if you genuinely feel like someone's a better captain, then you should be brave enough to go through with it. And I think the week coming up is quite a good example of this. Um, I'm sure there'll be some, some deeper captaincy chat later on, but Harlan's got another good game up in to Luton, but there's plenty of other options this week for a captaincy. And Harlan will stand out as being the safe one. But if you genuinely feel like someone else you own, like I've got Ivan Tony, for example, playing at home to Sheffield United. If I felt like he was the best captain, that matchup was the best matchup of the week, I should be daring, bold and fearless and, and go through with it rather than being safe. And I'm sure there's lots of people that, that play FPL that fall into that sort of bad habit of just captain in the same pick every week and maybe i feel, I feel like you're seeing straight through me it, it, I, I feel like i don't <laughs> i don't i don't think i remember a captain that wasn't the highest eo captain i don't think i remember one <laughs> but how many times in this time have you looked at an alternative and thought i actually prefer them to the plan a captain this week but because it's a bit bolder you haven't gone through with it there must be examples of it yeah i think um to be fair, the one time I went against the grain, and I don't really know if you can call it that, was in the double game week uh, Luton had earlier in the season when I went for Morris over Haaland and everyone was like, like, what are you guys doing captaining Morris from Luton? Like, what is wrong with you? 
I think the outcome worked out for me that time that you got like a few points more or something or they broke even I don't know but yeah there's very rare that's like all the way back in what game week seven I think maybe I've had one or two yeah, more incidents yeah. since then that I've like maybe last week you did it a bit right you captain Cole Palmer that wasn't the popular there was Saturday at a home game last week with Brighton was it Harland had an, an okay fixture as well hmm. so but there's been even the last game I know three of them ended up with Benio over 100% at the end but leading up to the to the, the deadline I think Palmer would have been classified as the the daring pick. He ended up with the highest CO, to be fair, in the end. Yeah, but... so I think what was crazy with him, right, is that leading up to the game, after his hat-trick, everyone was, like, piling in on him. And as the kind of the algorithms and models started, like, showing, like, that they prefer premiums, obviously, with history and teams to the better than Chelsea, <laughs> as you started to see Salah rise to the top of the algos, you then just suddenly saw loads of the content creators on that Salah captaincy and also all the kind of, I guess, analytics managers. So I do think that it could have been a much bigger lump onto Palmer. But in all my mini leagues where I looked, right, like where I've got my friends who I play with more casually, like especially like work colleagues, everyone's on Palmer cap. When I then go to like the FPL community on X, like it's like a real mix, as you say, of Salah, Sun, Harlan, Palmer, like it's actual spread. But last week I felt like I was there with the casuals and I was like, I'm really enjoying this. Like, I don't want to overthink it. Just, just captain him. I, looking back at it i should have thought why am i risking this that maybe he's tired he's played a lot like what if he gets subbed early like that kind of stuff never crossed my mind and sadly like he already had his rest right but last week i think it was it was a safe space to captain someone else because there was a lot of wide chat in the community around all these capacity choices i think people often felt like oh i can i can be a bit braver this week because there's not that clear standout captain. I think it's a well-known sort of talking point in the community that there's three or four options. Weeks like this one coming up, where you have got Haaland the home to Luton, I don't think you'll get that chat and that sort of safety net in the community that it's okay to captain someone else. You're looking for that authority, you're looking for that bias, aren't you, from others to say, yeah, you like that, do it. This club, I think, is more like, to say someone this week, Captain Ivan Tony, because no one will do it. It won't be spoken about on podcasts. It won't be spoken about as a, as a good thing to do. People are so talking about you... selling him, right? So it's like you're talking about captaining him and people are talking about selling him. I think we'll go into the matchups because I'm sure we'll talk about all this stuff as we go. But I just want to shout out a few people in the chat and say hello. And then we'll pull up your messages as we go. We'll start the questions for the Q&A at the end as always and timestamp that. So quick shout out to BW Splitter. First one in today. Good to see you. We've got Elrong. Good to see you, buddy. Podner. What's up, Podners? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, FPL Discomfort, big thank you to Kieran for stepping in with Gabriel. I think he did three shows in a row. So the both of them are probably like getting some well-earned rest. I say rest, but Gabriel's knee-deep in tax return. So I don't, I don't think uh, there's no rest for the wicked. It's going to be still continuing for him, poor guy. So we've got Coem Afternoon Gang. Good to see you, mate. Darnish Evening. Lovely to see you, buddy. Just a couple more. Just don't want to miss anyone. Claire FPL, good to see you. Thank you for tuning in live. And then just this one. So BW Splitter says that just playing FPL is daring, bold, and fearless. So just playing it is, you could say that we're, we're following in a Henry Kaiser's footsteps there. But um, let's go. Um, if you've got an understanding partner, right? It depends if it turns into arguments and fallouts and things like that's that. That's true. It could be if you look at it like that. Definitely. Um, before we go into the matchups, actually, what I did want to pull up because hot off the press, literally just before we went live, I think like an hour before we went live. They confirmed the double game week 37 fixtures. So I've got up the, da the data from Ben Krillin from his spreadsheet here. And um, obviously at the moment, it says very likely double game week for 37, but that is confirmed. So those are the correct fixtures. Uh, we're nine minutes in if you're listening on podcast, if you want to come and have a look at a graphic or just find Ben Krillin on Twitter, of course. Um, cool, I've just timestamped that. So I think the main reason I wanted to pull this up right at the beginning is just Obviously, we have the double game week in 34, we have the double game week in 35, and we have the double game week in 37. There's only six game weeks left. So really, this is the time to be daring, bold, and relish the competition and, you know, really start to think, what are my remaining goals for the season? Are there mini league rivals I want to beat? Is there gaps I need to close? Is there, do I want to shore up my space at the top of a mini league? Do I want to break the top 100k, top 50k, top 500k, top 1 million, whatever it is, right? I feel like now's the time to ask yourself those questions. What more do you want from the season? And there is a real opportunity here. People are going to be using chips galore. I think of the three double game weeks left, 
most people will probably use at least one to two chips across those. Some people even have free chips to use for those. So this is it. This is the exciting part time, you know, like it's really fun and really just in the chat, let us know what you're thinking. If you've got certain chip strategies you're on, you know, is anyone thinking about free hit 37, for example, instead of 34, is anyone thinking of wild carding a different week to 35? Is anyone going to bench boost in 34 instead of 37? Let us know what you're thinking, because um, as we go through the show today, I'm sure we'll talk more about chip strategy in the Q&A, but I wanted to bring this up just as a starting point so that when we think of stuff, Craig, we tell people, please tell us your chip strategy, because if you're asking questions in the Q&A, like, should I sell A for B? If we don't know whether you're on free hit 34 or not, we can't really give you an answer that's actually useful to you. So please, we are in that part of the season where Pras says, right, it's team specific. This I'll, I'll gladly take some recommendations, by the way. I've still got my triple captain to use. I'm looking at this here, and there's not one really clear double that stands out for a triple captaincy, I don't think, at least anyway. I think a lot of the fixtures are, there's a few doubles there that are fairly good, but there's not one that, you, that stands out to be amazing. So I've already ignored the Haaland one that most people use, the Solanke sort of plan B that some people use. So anyone that's got any recommendations for my triple captaincy chip, I'm all ears. And based on the philosophy, I'll gladly um, use it on something that's a bit more wacky and a bit more daring. Um, nothing stupid, obviously. I don't, I don't want someone suggesting Ben Burris and Diaz or something like that for triple captaincy. But if, if, there's, if it's reasonable, then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to, to make good use of that and be a bit different with it. Sorry, I just keep muting myself because I've got that fear of the dog barking the last few times. She's barked so much and she was right to be fair. Like she called the correct captaincy and everything. But um, we'll keep going. 11 minute 47. If you if you want to see the summary from the next G, Gabriel has kindly provided it for us. So this is the entire Game Week 33 matchups. It has all the net XG, the creativity, the expected data, the shots, shot space, goal predictor, zonal chances, and goalkeeper metrics home and away. So we will not be going through individual matchups like we normally do. We will cover all 10 games. But we're just going to kind of stay on this summary slide, Craig, and um, we'll go through the matchups in the order that they're going to take place in Game Week 33. Um, but yeah, I think overall, just a couple call outs before we go into the matchup. So this, the main thing I noticed was that Liverpool home to Crystal Palace, that's the top net XG of the week with 2.43. We then have in second, Man City home to Luton, two point, oh no, sorry, third, 2.13. Newcastle home to Spurs is 2.16. Um, Bournemouth home to United is 2.11. Arsenal is 2. And then we'll wrap it up with Spurs away at Newcastle 1.93. Those are kind of the the major net XGs that look like two goals for any teams in this game week. But um, yeah, I think just to quickly just check that. So we said 13 minutes in, we'll start the first matchup. So the first matchup of the week is actually Newcastle versus Tottenham. And I'm glad this is the first one because the net XG numbers there did surprise me a bit, right? So just from your point of view, um, so we've got Newcastle here to remind the listeners, uh, 2.16 net XG and Spurs 1.93. The net XG is predicting a 2-2 here, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Is it the case that it's like two defences that have recently struggled to keep any goals out are facing each other and it's a goal fest? Or do you feel one of them might end up being a bit more pragmatic and try to like shore up that defence slightly this week? It's going to hinge on, on Newcastle, right? You get, you've got the Newcastle of a couple of months ago that were very open, um, got spanked by Liverpool, um, Nottingham Forest had a field day against them and things like that. But the last couple of game weeks, actually, they've been a little bit tighter, uh, obviously, with the clean sheet um, most recently. But I think in terms of sort of XGC, the last couple of game weeks, so one of the top five teams, I think, across the last six game weeks, I think Newcastle also... In theory, they've tightened up a bit from the, the really open team that was existent a couple of weeks back. Um, how aggressive will they be in this game? The, the problem is you've got two you've got two teams with really intense presses. So there's there's a high possibility of defensive mistakes in this game if the press is really high and really intense. Um you obviously got the, the possibility of high ball turnover and then teams not being in good defensive shape when they lose possession. So they might, they might be overloads in certain part of the pitches and, and, and things like that. So certainly in terms of the matchup, it's a game that there's every possibility of having a lot of goals in it. Um, and it's saying in, I think Sun is actually, those that still own him, I sold him for, for Salah last week, but for those that still own him, I think he, the decision on him 
is arguably the most critical in this week because, again, there's a possibility he could have quite a few chances in this game and there's a possibility he could score a couple of goals in this game. But there's other sort of premium midfielders, we'll call them, we've also got good games this week. Some have got a blank next week. If you're sitting there at the moment with, with two free transfers and not a lot to do, I know we're both kind of in this position a bit, Nima. But if, you, if you're having some in that position... I feel stuck. Uh, yeah, I feel stuck because yeah. I was I was considering selling him for like a um, Arsenal or Liverpool midfielder and I kind of look at this fixture in the next year and I'm a bit like, am I jumping the gun here? Like, if I only had one free transfer, would I just roll? It's almost like, am I forcing the move? I don't know. Arsenal and Liverpool are the ones, right? If you're sat there with not your full quota of Arsenal or Liverpool right now, the, the net XG for both of them teams is higher than Tottenham here. Yeah? They've both got doubles right. next week. So and, and, and Tottenham don't even play like, next week, right? So it's kind of like I'm trying to get free fixtures for one, but it's like, am yeah. I getting it too early? So when we get to the other matchups, I'm sure we'll discuss it more, but with the news around kind of Foden's knock and part of me is now wondering that, oh, okay, um, like, do I sell Son? Do I just sell Foden? Because he was going to be on my bench next week, Foden, for the double game week to facilitate double game weekers. And now I'm kind of like, ooh, could I just like sell Foden if there's any kind of doubt in my mind that he won't start? And that way I still get one more week out of Son. So those are the kind of things I'm toying with. Obviously, I have a wild card, so I would look to bring Foden back potentially. So I think if I didn't have a wild card, like in your situation, Craig, I don't know if I'd be looking to sell Foden. I'm sending him next week. Next week, so in 34 rather than this week. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I didn't want to lose him for Luton, but I was prepared to send him next week for a doubler. I forget Luis Diaz or something next week, or, or Jota if he's back or something. But it's, it's a similar sort of suggestion. They, I think some owners have probably got the biggest decision this week, and it's it's how they feel this game is going to go. Um, I, I couldn't advocate definitely selling him because I think that the way the, the game state will be and the, and the matchup will be suggests he'll get chances. But the fact that he is away, the fact that St. James is historically is a bit of a fortress, and the fact he's got no game next week, there's clearly other players that you would expect to probably at least match him this week, and then obviously would do better next week. So I don't, I don't know where I'd stand if I still owned him. I'd, I'd probably sell, certainly if I had an Arsenal or a Liverpool spot in my squad available, I think I would probably sell some for an Arsenal or a Liverpool mid this week. What are your but thoughts on not... this then? Because it, it kind of connects nicely to this because Ariolo is my other goalkeeper to Dubravka and he's obviously looks injured. So I'd also be playing Dubravka in this fixture and looking at the net XG, like part of me questions like, what the hell? Like, what am I hoping for here? Like, is Dubravka going to do anything? Or actually, like, do I maybe buy a goalkeeper? But it just, like, do you see more upside in a goalkeeper to bench Dubravka? Like, if I was to sell Ariola over, like, Let's say Sun plus Dubravka versus no, sorry, sorry, Dubravka plus let's say Odegaard. Dubravka plus Odegaard versus Sun plus Pickford, or Sun plus Henderson or something. It, it doesn't um, seem great, does it? The goalkeeper move just looks like it's nice next week, but it almost feels a week too early, right? Yeah, like, no, imagine I Dubravka halls. Like I can see a world in which Newcastle win one 0 despite the net xG. Yeah, they are at home, right? I think you'd, you'd be happy. I, I'd probably take the punt on the attacking player in Fine. the situation or two. I'd probably prioritise selling Sun, I think, over over selling the Brevka. Well, hopefully you by the end of today, you'll tell me who to buy. Hopefully by the end of today, tell me who I'm buying for Sun because I'm open to selling him, but maybe I'll sell Foden instead if, if he's definitely going to look injured. But he, He's not the only player that probably ticks this, but I know we just talked about him, but there's plenty of people that have still got Pedro Porro, players like that. They're, now, I'm guessing there'd be a lot of people with Porro that might, he might be their first sub or something this week. But again, no fixture next week. Even the game in 35, albeit a double, is not one where we necessarily expect Tottenham clean sheets. So he's quite a lot of money if you still own him. And how many weeks do you genuinely want to play him now? So another decision, I think, is, is maybe a possibility of moving him on. So I mean, it feels a bit weird to sell Tottenham players because we know they've got the extra fixtures at the back end of the season. But looking at sort of the next at least two weeks, maybe even three weeks, I, th I think it's an argument for selling them, particularly the defensive ones. I think some's a harder sell, but Poro, I think I'd be looking to, for those with no wild card, I'd probably be looking to downgrade him, I think, to someone to free up some money that might allow sort of other things in the, in the later game weeks. 
Yeah, I guess uh, the question is, said. yeah, like the question is, let's say like um, if you were going to get like a Crystal Palace or Wolves defender, as I'm seeing some people get for their double, it's like, again, you're going to potentially get three fixtures out of that defender versus Poro's one fixture, right? you got to think they outscore him in that time. Yeah. Let's go to the next matchup because I'm sure we'll talk about Newcastle and um, and Spurs more as the questions come in for people and their kind of uh, transfer dilemmas. But I'm just conscious that like this fixture's had like nine minutes and I'm going to try and keep the next fixture to like five minutes because the next fixture, apart from FPL Discomfort, Kieran in the chat, I, I don't know who else really like has assets from Sheffield United apart from him. But I know you obviously have Tony. So the next fixture is Brentford versus Sheffield United. And um, I know it's a captaincy fought for you. So Brentford are 1.69 net XG. Sheffield United are 1.61. So Gabe has this as another like 1-1-2-2. One, one, two, two. What, what do you think? Obviously, we know that Tony had a bit of um, injury issues going into the last game. He didn't start. That was a bit of a shock that he didn't start. But surely this is like a prime time fixture. It, it, maybe the data obviously doesn't... Like, is the data so poor just because... Brentford have struggled lately. I know Tony himself hasn't been very clinical since his return from the ban, but surely Sheffield United, like this is a team that's what conceded over 70 goals as a negative 50 goal difference. Like it seems like a prime time fixture for me if you've got Tony or any kind of um, Brentford attackers. Well, but the last two weeks I've been very tempted to send them and I haven't because of this run. They've got Luton as well coming up. So I've obviously put a lot of faith into this run. Twice I've almost sold him for a sack in both of the last two game weeks. And this sack has been a lot better. Um, so I feel like he owes me Ivan Tony now. The fact I've been patient with him, and it's one of my sort of rules around FPL. I'm trying to get better at being patient. Um, I think I think like Sheffield United you know, have got a little bit better lately. I don't think they're quite as open as maybe they were when Aston Miller beat them 5-6-1, whatever it was. Brighton beat them 5-0. I think that little period of the season, they were obviously very open and Confidence was really down. I do, I do feel like they've got a little bit better. I think they've tightened up in midfield, particularly a bit more steel and tenacity in there. But Tony is just one of those what we call prime time strikers, right? He hasn't shown it for maybe 10, 12 weeks. He's got Embuemo back now. I don't, I don't think they've started a game together yet since Embuemo's come back. I might be wrong with that, but it feels like this could be the first time we get both of them starting a game together this season. Because obviously Tony missed the first half of the season and then Waymo got injured. So I do think that would be significant towards Tony's output. So I would probably rank the next year a little bit higher than 1.6. And I'd probably have it near a two. I don't, I'm not necessarily saying it's the highest thing. If I was to put together some sort of table like this, I don't think I would have Brentford top. But there was a, there was a period this season right, where I think there was some stuff going around social media that while we're messing around with captains, he just captain was playing against Sheffield United each week. And that that sort of, that's kind of calmed down a little bit, but I don't hate the idea. It, it, it's just a shame harlan has got Luton. If he didn't have Luton, then I'd be much more tempted to do this. I, I do feel that Harlan should start Luton. People are obviously trying to put doubts in each other's heads for that one. But um, yeah, I think a BW split is saying, yeah, that's correct. It, it will be the first time they both start together this season. So that in itself is a huge thing. So I guess for you, the presses and the training photos are most important just to kind of be sure that like he's not had any kind of weird setback during the week um, since last weekend and that he is definitely going to start because if he starts and Mubamo is starting with him for the first time this season, you got to think that like Brentford are, starting to it must be dawning on them that if they don't sort something out like they might sleepwalk into a relegation battle so surely like this is the time to come alive these are the prime time fixtures against these are like six pointers right they can relegate someone else <laughs> so yeah, yeah so it, I, it, I think it's quite a nice one but there, there so there's a few I, I don't see for example liverpool putting five past crystal palace they might be have a higher ceiling or more likely to score three I think I would say they're confident that the police but Liverpool to score two or three, but I don't see them scoring five or six despite them having the highest net XG. I don't see Arsenal scoring five or six against Villa despite a high net XG. Brighton and sorry, Brentford and obviously Man City are the two teams that do have that ceiling for me of being capable of scoring five or six this week. I think it's that that's sent to me compared to some other teams, but we'll see if I've got the balls to go through with it. 
I'll be keeping an eye out on your tweets um, closer to the deadline for sure. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any other players from these teams we want to discuss. I know Ben Barrett and Diaz has been looking great. Um, but yeah, like he, he's someone I've brought in in other formats. But I think if you had a free hit in 34, maybe you could be really sneaky and have him as like a fifth mid. Sheffield United have a double game week. Like obviously not the greatest attacking team in the world, but... If you're looking for a cheeky differential, then um, yeah, that, that's one to think about. I am starring your questions, guys. Um, any of them that, like, I think tricky your question about Jota, like, I think we'll probably discuss that in the Liverpool match. Some of them I'll try and do as we go in the relevant matchup. Um, just a quick one, Danish. I was going to say um, we will answer this, but can you let us know on live FPL how far are you from the top 10k points wise? So I know you're currently 42k. Um, but it would be good to know how far. I think realistically, yeah, that is possible, but it'll be good to know if it's like. 20 30 points away or like 50 plus points away with six and what chips he's got left yeah exactly because if you've got zero chips left i i would be more concerned (laughs) about staying in the top 50k than climbing i think um but that's a different debate so let's go this one's okay we did five minutes on that match that's that's not bad next one burnley versus brighton so we have a burnley with a net xg of 1.46 and brighton with 1.32 i never thought i'd see this day where the team of XG Kings themselves, Brighton, have a lower net XG than Burnley. I know Burnley do have a slightly more robust attack lately. They, they've been looking a lot better, but surely, surely this is like, surely if the Zerbi doesn't go full on like big galaxy brain and, you know, make some random team up, surely this is a walk in the park for Brighton. Like surely it favours them if Burnley attack them, no? I think I saw, I don't think I'm wrong in saying this, but I was looking at um, XG over the last six game weeks, and I actually think Brighton are the worst team in the league. You wouldn't believe that possible, right? Brighton got the lowest XG in the whole league over the last six game weeks. So, And that's probably why the next year so did that, got so <laughs> down on them, right? Because <laughs> it looks at the last six weeks only. <laughs> yeah, but they've lost a lot of attacking players. The team is full of more defensive players than we're used to seeing from them. Pascal Gross is more capable of being one of their attacking players, but even he seems to be playing quite deep. They're trying players like Van Heck in about three or four different positions. I've seen him play holding midfield, I've seen him play right back, they flip between a back three, back four. Obviously a lot of their sort of better wide players aren't available, the Matomas and the Fassies and all these sorts of players. So they are limited, I think, at the moment with attack. They rely on players like Bonanotte, who are probably steady Premier League players long term, but they're not the sort of players that are going to carry the team forward. They've only really got a Dingra at the moment who poses any sort of... Sort of so the one I'm excited by is Jao Pedro's return. Obviously, with the kind of double game week announcements that we saw and stuff, right? So like I'm just having a look here. So I'm someone who's going to be on wildcard 35 most likely. And um, yeah, just kind of looking at that, Brighton have um, Bournemouth in game week 35. They have Aston Villa in 36. They then have a double game week against Newcastle and Chelsea. So... I don't know, what would you think about someone like Jao Pedro's return? Because I feel that he was, you know, he was their best player this season for me. And he he got given a bit of a hard talking to by the manager to the press, asking him to do more, expecting more. But I remember Gabe and I said, that's probably because the manager believes that he can take that information and become even better. So it's almost like mm-hmm. he's pushing him to be the best version of himself. So I'm quite excited by his return. But do, do you think that his return could be that what they need to be a bit less toothless in attack compared to how they've been lately? Oh, they'll be better with him. If they play him on the left, the Dingo on the right, and, and Welbeck through the middle, I think they'll be in there. If they can get gross or fire play as a number 10, I think that gives them enough right up front to, to, to be dangerous again. But the unknown with them is really what they're playing for now. Is Deserby playing for central moves to a different club? Is he just going to think, we're on the beach, we haven't got a lot to play for now, so we'll just trial some weird and wacky formations and styles in the hope of hitting on something that could be useful next season. Or are their games just going to be high-scoring games end-to-end, really open? Because um, they're United, they're like the two teams at the moment, it could be involved in three or draws most weeks. They've got that way of playing that allow for that. So they're exciting picks, aren't they? Right? And they always have been since deserve he's been there. So Pedro takes that box and he's got penalties. So I wouldn't I wouldn't get him in right now. If you obviously you're talking a couple of game weeks time on the wild card. For those that aren't on that plan, I don't think I'd be making a move for a Brighton player 
at the moment because I say the, the XG numbers lately just aren't. Um, I mean, well, enough positivity around them, I guess, to to trust them at the minute. I think I'm doing the game week 35 show with Kieran, maybe. And if you're listening, Kieran, in the chat, if feel discomfort, man. I'm just telling you now, yeah, make sure you remind me at the time to not buy a Stupinan or Lamperty on my wild card, and especially not both, please. Like, whatever happens, please make sure you remind me of that because everyone saw the pain I went through with those two buggers, and I basically just replaced it with double Bournemouth defence, and those two buggers have now been the two that are screwing me over. So I just keep going from one double defence of a shit defence to another. But um, in terms of just before we move on, about this idea of being on the beach. Did you see De Zerbi's interview about whether he'll be there next season? No, but I can, I can have a good story. He was very non-committal. He was very non-committal. He was basically like, I need to, he's like, I've not spe- spoken to the ownership. We kind of need to sit down, paraphrasing obviously, but he's like, we need to sit down at the end of the season and I need to see whether their ambitions match my ambitions. And if, if they're ambitious enough to do what I want to do, then I'll stay basically. So he's like, if they're not going to like, help me create a winning team and like buy better players and like they have ambitions of competing for Europe again. Like he's like, yeah, like I might go to somewhere that does want to use me to do more. So I'd keep an eye on that as well. You're right. So I don't know if he's just kind of, maybe he's coming across differently, but overall it felt like he was very non-committal about his future. And I do wonder if that's because he's thinking certain Premier League jobs might open up over the summer and, maybe he can fight his way into a very nice contract somewhere that has a lot more money to spend. Um, I love what he's been doing there, but it is a real thing to consider. Like if the players don't think the manager's going to stay, like does that change the dynamic in terms of what they're willing to fight for him? I, I don't know. It's a tough one. Hopefully I know before they're double and I can make a good decision. So many of these narratives, right? The obvious narratives are teams playing for relegation, teams playing for the top four and stuff. Look out for those teams. But you've got players like Ivan Tony who might be leaving. So what's his sort of has he going to play the end of the season he's going to try and put himself in the shop window try and get an England squad or is he just going to think oh, I can't be bothered with this I've just got to get through three months without getting injured or something and it's, it, there's all these sort of things um, yeah I, I quite like to see the Zerbi at Man United but um, the only team that wants sort of an attacking manager that plays sort of expensive football he's going to be sort of top target number one isn't he and I think Man United are going to I think the question is like there's a chance obviously Ten Hag stays and continues to build on from where he is but um, if he didn't stay then obviously there's been talks of the likes of Southgate and uh, others in that group but yeah I think if I was a United fan like let me know if you feel otherwise in the chat I think I I would rather the Zerbi personally than Southgate but I guess each to their own Um, so. They just seem like that's completely different types of managers. Like I want the one that's going to make my team play exciting attacking football, not not uh, not not Southgate playing with two holding mids and a, and a ten when when we've got some of the best talent in world football right now playing for us. If you're a United yeah. fan that really really likes Harry Maguire, then you want Southgate to be your manager. That's probably the answer. Yeah, <laughs> well, I do think he definitely gets the best out of Harry Maguire. I, I think Harry Maguire for England is faultless at times, but um. Let's keep going. So the next fixture is actually a big one. Man City versus Luton, 33 minutes in. So the Man City next, G as a reminder, is um, 2.13. And Luton's is 1.08. I believe that's joint bottom lowest next year of the week. I don't really think I can condone buying a City defender. I know some went for Guardiola. He didn't play. Then he banged some screamer last night. Wonder if he'll play on the weekend. So it's like just that whole experience... I've experienced it too many times. Like I've seen people buy Edison the week he doesn't play anymore. I've, I've bought these players, Aki, Akanji, Stones. Like I just, I can't. God, the old D. There's so many of them, man. Rico Lewis. Like I can't do that to myself. So, despite the great looking clean sheet odds here, I am definitely just looking at Man City more so. And what would you say to someone who didn't have like a Foden and was, if you got news that he was starting on the day, could he be the Sun replacement? based on the fixture and then you know the next year like could you be doing sun to foden and if or let's say you knew a different city mid was starting and you took a punt could you buy any random attacking city mid and just target this fixture at luton or are luton not as much of a pushover as the data suggests what do you think like tactically do you think they have enough to fight off man city no 
No. Um, okay, so you think so? If you, so you think it's a Man City win at a minimum? Then the question is, how many goals are we expecting from Man City? This feels like one of those games where City could get sort of three up at half time, and then the second half becomes basically a procession where they play in second gear, keep the ball. No one wants to overly exert themselves. They've obviously got quite a big load of fixtures coming up, FA Cup, Europe, all these sort of games coming up. So it does feel like this the sort of game where Guardiola will tell City do a bit minimum. I don't know if he'll make seven, eight changes and basically rest the first team for this game. But it does feel the sort of game that if City are comfortable at half time, 2-0, 3-0, that there might be some sub second half. Certainly there'll be a, a drop in intensity, I think, and a, a focus on ball retention and just do the basics and keep things tight. Don't do anything stupid. So that, that's the other thing that's making me a bit hesitant to, to, to maybe Captain Harland here because the, the easy thing you can do in this game is just rewind back to the FA Cup game a couple of months ago when obviously Harland went mad. Um, and because it happened once, everyone assumed it happened again. The same way everyone thought Salah was going to score. I was like, I was against Man United, but they came because they did it once before. And people were a bit fickle like that, aren't they? That, they, their brain is so wired to all sort of one previous match that they just expect it again and again. And so much um, would have changed, right? So I think it was De Bruyne assisted like four of those goals, right, in the cup. And like, who knows what's happening with him and his fitness. We know he was obviously vomiting before the game. He was probably due to start against Madrid and then he didn't. So like, do they play him against Luton to get him match fit and sub him early with the next leg of the Champions League in mind? Do they just not play him at all? Like, Surely City think they don't need all their best players to win this game. And yeah, I don't know, man. Like, if KDB wasn't starting, how would I feel about a Haaland captaincy? I'd probably want it less, I would argue. So for me, a lot of that comes down to, do I feel like if Foden isn't going to play, if De Bruyne isn't going to potentially play, do I really want to be captain in Haaland if Alvarez is the guy supporting him instead of Foden and De Bruyne? Probably not. One of those two is going to play. I don't think he'll go into a game now about at least one of those two. I think that they're clearly the supply line for City now and that sort of the player that takes the game by the scruff of the neck. I think Foden has become that player for the men City in the last sort of few months. So I, I can't see a game now where one of those two isn't sort of in that central role as a as, as sort of chief creator. Logic would say Bernardo would get arrested this game. He feels like the one that's probably his due one. Um, and he's, yeah, and he's right, definitely right. going to, and surely he's definitely going to play Champions League, like his big game player. Like he, he'll be yeah. there for that game. <laughs> so he's, if he's not playing on the right, what does that mean? They're going to play Doku on the right, although Guardiola normally uses him on the left. He can play on the right. Belgium played him on the right, I think. Um, or will they play Foden? Will they put Foden out on the right? He's obviously been seen there quite a lot this year. So it's hard because, yeah, it's just. Pep Roulette's bad enough at the best of times. I think, based on right now, we don't know what games Pep's prioritising in what order. I say they're in the league's clearly not won. They can't underestimate Luton. There's obviously the big Real Madrid second leg. There's FA Cup. You can't play the same 11 in all of them. Um, that would probably make me hesitant to go and buy any Man City player. Um, just okay, for that reason. Whoever you get is going to be a minute's risk in any sort of game weeks between now and the end. I'd be interested what you do on your um, wild card. How many you get? Because they have to double in 37, but you may not get someone that plays both the games, right? Yeah, so Colm is saying like Alvarez might be one he's thinking about this week. Um, and Gareth currently has no Haaland, no Man City, free hit 34, bench boost 37, madness not to get him this week. Yes, yeah, so I think just different ideas so bw splitter doesn't have harlan might bring him in for tony if there was news that tony didn't start yeah. so yeah so for you it's more like you wouldn't be going in right now um i guess it depends on chip strategy say so that for gareth for example if there's no captain he's happy with this week maybe buying harlan knowing that he's going to free hit next week and he wants to venture boost in 37 with no wild card in between maybe yes is... like these fixtures you have to have salah or Sa and they're good captains this week. I think it's, it's not like one of those weeks where one captain is so far on head and shoulders above everyone else. A lot and of the teams have got good games. Even Cole Palmer, right, is captain this week. Everyone's got hit. <laughs> well, I've got Pod so, that asks, does Edison play this week? Yes, yeah, so I think I was a bit shocked that he, he didn't start in the Champions League. Do you, do you feel that it's Ortega's place to lose now? Or is he just kind of like keeping him out of the firing line and letting him get fully fit. No, nah, this is like, probably a lot of 
Like I don't oh, like yes, I, I don't know if you this. own yeah, do you own him? Do you own him? Because if you don't own him, like if you look at him, I wouldn't be buying him, is what I would say for them. But <laughs> I think Ortega's a good enough keeper to um to kind of fill in. So like if you had other city defenders, I wouldn't be quite put off by like the clean sheet odds just because it's Ortega or over Edison personally, but I wouldn't be like I said earlier, I wouldn't think it to get any city defenders, goalkeepers, players. Um but yeah, I think for me, if if I knew KDB starts, like I think I'm pretty much locked on that Harlem captaincy as much as I hate to say it. Um, just I can't look past this fixture, like home game against Luton. Four days, I think, between that and the next Champions League tie for them. So I see absolutely no reason why Harlem would need a rest. Like Claire saying in the chat, you know, he had 20 touches yesterday in one shot. And I'm like, I can believe that with no KDB. Yeah, I can believe that. And Harlem pulls up those numbers all the time. But he has one. Oh, like yeah, yeah, I think he'll, he's probably quite a good opportunity to play this. I would think. Yeah, yeah I, so I, I, so I think he's a good. punt. He's a nice punt. Let's say you had a third striker that wasn't playing or was injured, or you heard that, like, let's say Tony didn't start. If you can't just go from Tony straight to Holland, maybe Tony to Alvarez is a nice little punt. It will be some that might be on free hit 34 wild card 35 strategy i'm sure so anyone that is in that position with a complete one week punt i could, I could see alvarez being sort of high on the shortlist to bring in that situation this week i think edison plays if you're looking for a game to phase him back into the team he's been injured you know you're not going to get a nicer game than this they're at home they're against a the team that will concede a lot of the possession Edison's obviously main part of his game is distribution and stuff. If you just want to get him back in for 90 minutes to basically set him back into a match environment, pretty much as nice as he's going to get at this time of the season, isn't it? Home to Luton in a, which should be quite a routine and comfortable league game. So I'd, I'd probably expect Edison to play this. If he was fit enough for the bench on Wednesday, uh, or Tuesday even, um, then I'd expect him to start this. Yeah, fair. So I think the reason Pod not asked is that he actually bought Ortega at 3.7 million. So I think there's a no risk there to starting him. Like, obviously, we are expecting Edison to come back in at this stage. Um, but equally, it's kind of like well, if he doesn't play, like as long as you have a backup goalkeeper that actually plays, then I think I'd still play Ortega over them. Like, I think that's a cheat code, 3.7 million um, goalkeeper. Like, if he still somehow got that number one jersey come the next double game week, you're laughing. Um See, I will hold on to him for now um, and just see whether it is genuinely a fight for the shirt or is it that Edison is just being eased back in? I think that's something we'll not really know before the deadline. But um, what else do we have here? So Tricky MF says, if KDB plays, that supply line is immense. Look at last season. Cool. Okay, let's go to the next one. We're 42 minutes in. This one is actually uh, Nottingham Forest at home to Wolves. So we have a net XG for Nottingham Forest of 1.51. Wolves 1.08. That's not what I wanted to see. Um, I'm quite excited by Wolves. Um, I'm one of the idiots who didn't go for Mateta earlier on when I saw Watkins and I went for Cunha, who's played 14 minutes and 35 minutes since with like a combined 0.01 XG. Um, yeah, and, 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 and you know, when I benched Foden for Cunha, turned out Cunha still didn't start and uh, Mateta did start and scored. So... I tried to be clever. I tried to go for... I, I told myself I prefer Cunha and Eze to Sarabia and Mateta. That's what I told myself. And I was convinced Cunha would be starting games by the time game week 34 came around. And here I am in a situation where if Foden doesn't play again, it's Cunha coming off my bench in this tie. And we're saying that Wolves have a 1.08 next year, even if Cunha starts. So I'm hoping you could tell me, Craig, that you, you, you have Wolves a bit higher up in this fixture than the next year does because... It's looking like 2-1 to Forest is what the next G is implying, but I would have thought Wolves have every chance to get points here. The, obviously, the results haven't been very good lately, and it's, it's clearly the reason why it's a big drop-off in all their attacking threat, right? No Neto, no could no Cunha, no um, White. So I don't think he's got anything to worry about in terms of his job, Gary O'Neill. And they're another team that are basically rooted to mid-table now. What are they playing for? But I don't think that I don't think these youngsters that they've, they've had to play um, as an alternative are really working out yet, and I don't think the managers going to want to persevere with their development over just getting Cunha in the team. He, he he should start this is, is would be my take. Two sub appearances seems a logical sort of 
low progression to then put him into the starting lineup and let him play 60, 70 minutes and take him off. So I, I would expect him to, to play this. Um, with Saravia and players like that around him, he, he could score. Um, they're playing team in the minute wolves because I say this fixture on paper looks semi reasonable. Then they've got two home games in the double. So I can see why people are getting tempted by wolves players. And they're seeing Nate Norrie in the box, every possibility, because he's playing sort of a more advanced role because of the, the lack of attacking players. And I can see why that's quite exciting. I think him in particular is unsurprisingly top at the moment for loads of attacking metrics among defenders, which say not really surprised, which pretty much play centre forward, take up a really high sort of starting position and get in the box of that. So again, for someone like yourself, who's on a, who's got a wild card to use up, I can see the logic in moving to him for a couple of weeks. And then when the attacking players start coming back, I, I expect him to get phased backwards back into a wing back slash more defensive role. And then maybe his use isn't so good, but that won't matter to you because you can wild card him out. So people that are in that position, I think he's probably he's probably quite a good transfer priority, I would say, for the next two game weeks. And I think people were unlucky, it. right? Because um, he, he was on for a haul before uh, he got subbed with a knock <laughs> for the pre-60 minutes. So he, he looked like he was really going for it and then bang, he got subbed. So I think we need to keep an eye on his fitness. But he's someone who I actually brought in in a bunch of different other formats last week. Is that my priority transfer, yeah. knowing he was going to play in the front three? while others are coming back like Huang as well. So ultimately, I do think the Huang, Sarabia and Cunha will probably be the final front three with him dropping back, as you say. But right now, as long as he's fit for this next fixture, I think he's my, like my number one target outside of uh, <laughs> Liverpool and Arsenal. That some, that some players are short-term. Just situation amongst the clubs, like availability means that some players are a good thing for a really short window of time. We've had it before with Arsenal, with like Enketia, just circumstance, meaning he had a run in the team and he got quite a lot of points for people in those periods. Conor Bradley's had it for a short period of Liverpool, three or four game weeks with where it's meant he's had to play a lot of games and anyone that was on that at the right time have got good points from it. Eight Norley, I think, has got maybe one or two, two more weeks of this good situation. I say he could have scored against Villa two games ago, missed a one-on-one -on -one with Martinez, did score against West Ham. Still expect him to be quite high up in advance for a single or a double now. Um, after that, who knows? He may he may stay advanced at the end of the season. He may end up dropping back. But I so say I think that people have got defensive issues at the minute. I think he'd probably be my number one target at the moment. Not yeah, so no, much I, I like that. Move. Yeah, no, no, I like him as number one defensive target, as you say. If you've got defensive issues, um, I don't have my quota of triple Arsenal, triple Liverpool. I did toy with the idea of Van Dijk, so I'll wait till we get to the Liverpool matchup, which I think is a couple of matches away, to hear what you think about him. It feels like, I think Gabe said in the Discord that he, he was looking at like a Van Dijk goal based on this matchup and the next G. So, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear, see, see his matchup spread later in the week. But um, do, do you still feel he's like that good an option, right, Nuri, to prioritise over an Arsenal defender or Liverpool defender? Like, is it... Because he, he is playing in the front three, right? Like, he's literally playing in the front three. And Huang wasn't on the bench yet. So that make, gives me major doubts of him yeah. playing both games in 34. So surely there's still a spot there in the front three that needs him. I think in Arsenal, Liverpool in particular, are a far better attacking team than defensive ones. If you've got a Liverpool spot, I think the priority is an attacking player. Arsenal, I think, at the moment... Defender transfer just a bit boring. What are you expecting to get from a Saliba or a Ben White for a couple of weeks? You could get yeah, Ben White. I don't, I don't really want started. them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really <laughs> want them. Like, I'm looking at, like, an Odegaard or a Kai Havertz or a Martinelli. That's yeah. another Arsenal attacker. I'd, I'd be the same, I think. I'd, I'd be looking at Kai Havertz, right? You've got a, I, mean, oh, I want to differentiate, like right? from the people yeah. who already have the double Arsenal defence and can't get to the second attacker. Like, it feels like this is my one chance to do something different yeah. to them. Okay, so you're saying maybe like a midfield five where it's like Salah, Diaz, Saka, Havers, um, like Cole Darwin Palmer, up right? top, Cole Palmer. Well, maybe yeah. maybe not Palmer for you. If you're a wild card, he's obviously got Arsenal away next week. You might not want to play him then. So maybe he can go. So he's a sell. Yeah, so he was my sell and I was looking at like Eze. But now I'm thinking instead of getting like a Van Dijk or a Gabriel... Could I just get an Ait Nuri, like you're suggesting, as a good prospect for two weeks, just taking this opportunity while it presents itself, and then just pile into Liverpool and Arsenal attack instead of Eze? It's, it's, it's more exciting doing that to me than buying Saliba and someone else. I'd rather get Saliba and Eze, yeah. 
you know, I'd, I'd rather get eight Laurie and Havertz than Saliba and Eze if that was the choice. Cool. All right. Well, that's good to know. Um, we'll keep going. We are actually halfway through the matchups show. So, 50 minutes in, I'm going to ask for the first time to please do hit that like button if you're enjoying the show, if you're entertained, if we've made you laugh along at home, whether with us or at us, uh, either one is okay. If you're new to the channel, please do subscribe. No, normally it's at us, but um, yeah, I think um, Kieran says, FPL this company says, Nima and I doing the show together while we're both wildcarding in Game Week 35. That show will be carnage. I definitely agree. That's going to be carnage. And I just, I'd love to see how different our wildcards will be. I might ask us both to put a wildcard draft where we've not seen each other's and we only show each other like as we're going live and we put it onto the show for the day and we can kind of rip each other's drafts apart. But um, so we're halfway through. Um, the next game is Bournemouth versus Man United. Let me just put the timestamp real quick. So Bournemouth versus Man United we have. So this one is 2.11 net XG for Bournemouth. Man United are on 1.69. So this is something I was surprised by, Craig. I don't know what you think, but I saw some bookies odds and they had Bournemouth as favourites for this tie. And in Gabe's kind of next year they shared in the Discord, he says Solanke to pop off. So that's his kind of matchup perspective for this game. I, I found it very surprising. Like I, I do feel that Man United over the last three, four, maybe five games, do feel like their attack seems to be improving, steadily improving. I don't know if I'm just imagining it because I was supporting them on Sunday, but it, it feels like to me that they're playing better in the transition now and like they, they seem to be getting forward better than they were earlier parts of the season. But like, yeah, like sure, surely this isn't... How can we be going into a game with Bournemouth for favourites with the bookies? I just don't get it. Uh, have you not seen Man United try and defend in the uh, recent games? I'm not saying Man United won't score. To, to be fair, goals. I'm just talking about their attack improving. But, um, <laughs> it, it's tough when you've had 40 different defensive combinations across your back line, right? And like I guess other teams have settled defences, settled centre-back pairings. Like it's, it's pretty intense, just the sheer number of different personnel that have filled in in different roles in that back line. So I suppose it is hard, isn't it, to to maintain any kind of solid defense in that situation so I, yeah i feel a bit for them like from an injury point of view but maybe that does play into solanke's favor if you're playing they're, they're just... kambawala i don't know if kambawala starting again but like 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 what's going to happen to them yeah i don't blame the players so much actually there it's just that much space they leave i think my sunday league team's got better defensive shape than man united there's so much space around the players for the teams to pass through any team with any sort of ruthlessness should really sort of expose that. And it's like, in terms of the players, they've got mainly Casemiro Bruno, who's a, a pretty good midfield, right? But they don't all press together. They all man mark. And it, it, it's just sort of a bit of carnage. It's just left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing almost. It feels like to me, Man United. So they're always open to conceding goals. So I would agree with, with, with Gabe. I, I own Selenki, and he's another one that in theory I could captain this week. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that in terms of XGC, Man United are the worst team over the last six game weeks by a considerable distance. So does that suggest they should concede the most goals week to week? They're away here against a team with quite good attacking shape. Solanke has got a double next week as well. I think just spent about eight nor you'd be in the best defender transfer. It's probably hard to argue that Solanke might not be the best attacking transfer based on the fact he's got Man United now. And I think the double he's got next week is two teams also uh, fairly low down on the XGC list or high up, whichever way you want to view the table. So there's probably quite good um, potential from Solanke across these next three fixtures. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's there for him. Um, and if the Bournemouth midfielders can find spaces in those pockets and in those half spaces in, in front between uh, and to the side of the Manchester United holding midfielders, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for him to create chances for him. So, yeah, I, I like him this week. And I, I think Bournemouth a form of three, two, four, two is more than feasible. In this so, game. you think both teams it will be like a very so you're expecting like a high scoring game, both teams to be going kind of, I guess, a basketball match style game, right? Like end to end. And yeah, we're not looking at like I, a I, one nil win, we're not looking at a one nil win for either team, right? Like, it should be quite I, exciting I, for neutral. I've got Garnett at the minute, and I'm begrudgingly got in the first slot because all of my starting have been all playing at home. And I know that doesn't mean you don't. And away players. It's not a case of pick the home players over the away players, but all of my players have got quite good games. And looking at it, I think that I've got Solanke, Tony Harden. I can't mention any of those three as my strikers. 
we've already spoken about the prospects for those three teams. Then I've got Foden, I'm not benching Saka, I'm not benching Saka, I'm not benching Impala. So Garnacho is the odd one out of my sort of front eight. So your only hope is if Foden does like a zero minute show and then like you get, you get them Garnacho points off. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in no rush to bench him because so I've got Garnacho as, as the first sub. And so I don't like this fixture for Garnacho. It's just that it feels weaker than the other seven attackers. Than what you got, already but, have, yeah. So, but Podner makes a good point that, like, obviously last week Liverpool were favourites. So I think what I would say, Podner, is, um, yeah, like Liverpool were not clinical. Like when I look at the underlying numbers of that game, like how, how they didn't get two or three up at half time, Lord knows. And you know, like those two goals from right now were phenomenal. Trust me, I was celebrating them. I was proper supporting Man United that day, and <laughs> I couldn't believe my luck when Mainu come through and score that goal. But um, yeah, I think overall, I would say that. I am interested in the Man United attack. Garnacho is my number one kind of favourite target longer term. Obviously, they have the double game week coming up, as Podner mentions. He says the attack's ramping up for game week 37. Um, based on the fixtures I've seen, I think I'll probably look more at that in game week 35. I'm kind of not looking at United until I get to that chunk of fixtures from 35 to 38. I think for now, I'm just focusing on 33 and the double in 34 before our wild card. But I would love to pick your brain, Podner, on um, which United assets you think that I could potentially be targeting when we do the wild card show with me and FPL discomfort in two games time. But and then Podna asks um, just this question here about what about the penalty on Bissaka? Do you have any opinions on this? I, I don't really have anything to say here about penalty on one Bissaka. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how that helps us into game week 33. But is there anything you want to say? Or all right, you're playing for it, right? How many times you see he's he's kind of. Once a defender, I'm a defender, right? Sunday league, I'm defending, I'm going to be a defender for Team South in game week 39. Anytime you slide in in the box and don't make contact with the ball, you're leaving yourself open to committing a foul, is the way I view it. If you don't play the ball, you've been rash. Now, he doesn't, I think he's already on his way down, can't be yet, before Wemba Saka touches him, but then as he's on his way down, then there's contact. But it's never going to get overturned by VAR. There's contact, you haven't played the ball, and there's contact with the player. Now let's say um, VAR did uh, so not VAR. Let's say the on-field ref hadn't given a penalty. I also don't think VAR would have then said no. You need to give a penalty. I don't think they would have overturned it either way. I do think it's quite soft for me. Like I, I don't understand how Liverpool were given that penalty personally. I, I don't understand. Like having watched it in slow motion back and seeing that, like essentially, like I think the way I look at it right is that once the contact did get made, even though it was with a trailing foot. It's impossible not to give the penalty. Like, it's just when you see it in slow motion, right? It's really easy not to realize that the pace at which Juan Masaka is sliding in and it's so reckless and unnecessary. Like, Elliot was going nowhere. I just don't know why he did it. That's all I'm saying. So, like, I think he's he's raised the question for the ref to make that choice. And I don't think it was a penalty, but it's like, it's naive to even go in like that, as you say, as a defender. Like, you just can't be doing that. Like, you can't be going off the floor and, like, don't even touch the ball. Like you just can't. Defending is hard now. There's certain things you can't do. You've got to make be sure where your arms are all the time. That's why defenders defend with their arms behind their back because they're worried that the ball might strike their hand even by accident. It's going to get given the same ball. So rules now, defender, put your hand behind your back so you don't give up an easy hand ball and, and don't slide into a tackle in the box if you don't play the ball. It's, it's infuriating to me, the ones when the ball's going one way and the player's body shape's going a different way, which is what happened in the in the the penalty that he's talking about if I'm a sucker that Elliot nudged the ball in one direction and basically moved in the other way to encourage the contact. So he that's what I mean. I feel, I feel like it's actually the most well thought out dive, if you want to call it a dive, because <laughs> when his foot is getting crunched by both of Van Basaka's feet either side of it, like that is a penalty at that point. I'm sorry. Like I don't care whether like originally he missed his first foot or not. Like he very yeah. cleverly planted his foot in the one place that this reckless dive was going to get punished. And at that point you got to just learn and not do dumb shit like that right so let's keep going because there's a f quite a few more fixtures to go through um just a comment here from Colm that i like which is if hoyland scores this game week he will go to the top of my transfer in list he's a confidence player similar to moon at fulham i think hoyland's been great um i've loved seeing his uh kind of evolution as the season went on he, he did have that run as you say of like doing very well consistently in the new year so I think it was after the winter break, if I'm not mistaken. I really like him as a player, and he's someone I will be interested in going forwards. 
Um, and I think eight with 35 onwards. I think Haaland's obviously going to be popular with the double in 37. I think mm. Isak will be popular with the double in 37. Boylan's got a double in 37. Nicholas Is that Jackson's Boylan v Jackson, Jackson, yeah. Um, maybe people will go double attacking for Alvarez in with Haaland. I don't know. It's probably about six or seven strikers that are probably should be on everyone's shortlist from that point onwards. I think he's a, he's a valid option as the third striker. That's how I'd probably go Haaland first, Isak second, and then one of Jackson or is the third choice. Sounds um, good. All right, let's go to this. Let's go to this seventh matchup of the week, real quick. So we have the Sunday now. We're on. So we've done all the Saturday fixtures. We have Liverpool at home to Crystal Palace. So Liverpool, as we said, had the top net xG of the week, two point four three. Crystal Palace on zero point seven eight. Oh, that is actually the lowest net xG of the week. Earlier, I said the one point zero eight from Luton and Wolves were the joint lowest, but actually. That's not true. Uh, <laughs> Crystal Palace not 0.78 next year. This is shocking stuff. Um, I don't know, man. Olise is back. I'd like to think that him, Eze, Mateta in his current form, I think they're being underappreciated here by the net XG. It's obviously not going to account for Elise in the metrics of the last six game weeks for them. So I do expect to see more from Palace, but as much as I hate to say it, I just don't see how this is not a comfortable Liverpool win. I'm expecting like three one, and maybe not a Liverpool clean sheet. What do you reckon? Um, Palace have actually been quite good defensively since Gladstone has been there. He's done that standard thing as a new manager and on focused on sort of solidifying the defence first rather than sort of focusing on the attack. Most managers have been coming with with that mentality. And I said again, in terms of defensive numbers, Palace have been one of the better teams across the last sort of five six game weeks. So I think they'll be quite resolute. I don't particularly rate most of their defenders, which doesn't make it any easier. Like likes of Joel Ward and then has to play Jefferson Lerner in the back three lately because Richards is out and things like that. So it's not been easy. But I think they've, they've set up with good shape in a lot of their games and they've got a back three, so they, they keep the central areas quite compact. Uh, Liverpool have already just proven against Man United that a lot of their players can be quite wasteful. And maybe they always maximise sort of good opportunities and good sort of game state situations. I wouldn't be surprised if Liverpool only win this one. Um, as much as I said earlier, there's probably a, quite a high chance they'll get two or three. But I don't think Liverpool will score four or five here. I, I, I think they're more likely to score one than four. Do, do you so, think that? Do you think that like last weekend's result? Do you think that's gonna play into their minds? Like, will that change anything? Um, yeah. What do What do you think about that? Because part of me is a bit like. I'm really questioning like how they weren't more ahead by half time. I just can't comprehend it, like like genuinely. So it's like, is that just going to keep happening, or like, sh- surely like they're thinking to themselves that like, they can't let this title slip. Like, aren't they running on the energy and passion? You know, like send off Klopp with the farewell, like get him that second Premier League. Like, sh- surely, surely, I just I, I can't comprehend what's going on. Like, I don't. It can't it can't just be blamed on Darwin. I I know we like to laugh at Darwin, but like. Salah himself, there was a shot I saw against United. I think I remember he was just, he could have gone near post and he tried to shoot the near post and he just skied it. And I was like, oh, even Salah's missing the chances that he would normally get on target. Like, like what, what's going on? Like, I, I don't know. Like, he looked off to me against Man United. I, I'm not completely convinced he wasn't at least partly injured. I know he's just come back from an injury, but he looked on fire in a bright game. The, 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 was it 12 shots, 13 shots, and the team seemed set up towards assisting him and a couple of times you see him like full burners on blasting down the middle of the pitch to try and get on the end of something he seemed to be playing in a bit more reserved to me against man you know i was quite worried because i kept him also got a bit lucky he got the pet he didn't really look like scoring much else he, he didn't seem to want to take anyone on he was coming towards the ball and laying it off first i wasn't having the same explosive i never thought he like, was in the positions off. yeah i never thought he was the one who as you say they were focusing on funneling through like it's like everyone else was taking chances, like Diaz, you got Darwin, you got, everyone's there. But like the odd time he did get involved more centrally, it was quite rare, I thought. Like I didn't really see him. Yeah, you know, something just didn't seem right to me with him. Like Connor, Connor Bradley, I don't know if I'm imagining, but I felt like Connor Bradley was appearing more in the positions than Salah. Yeah. Am I missing something? Like, I felt like he was on the half space on the right, more often trying to cut into the box than Salah, who felt like he wasn't there. Like I was like... I was watching it thinking, like, how is he going to get points? Is he playing? Like, 
Salah played more like Haaland, but I think we, we kind of know with Haaland that what he's told to do is just retain a central space and then make some movements off of that. We don't expect him to move, run the channels, drop short. He's basically there to be a, a president in that final third century. Liverpool never really asked Salah to do that, but it's kind of like what he did against Man United. That might have been instruction from Klopp to, to play more like that and hold that position, but I don't think it was. So I think he was managing something. Um, Say so Darwin, you, we, we do make him the scapegoat, but his decision making at pivotal times is not great. Like trying to, he could pass and then tries to shoot, should shoot and tries to pass. And a lot he of does nice stuff, even. right? Like there wasn't, like he had that really nice header to Diaz, right? Like really nice play. And then like the rest of the game, I'm watching him like, what is he doing? Like, what is he actually yeah. doing? He wouldn't be surprised if he, to me, if he didn't play this one. Um, they've obviously got Gakpo who could, who could have some minutes. Jota's back training. He's the most clinical, probably, attacker they've got. So if there is a concern at the moment that they need someone who is more clinical in an attack, they've got Jota there that could maybe be used as a through the middle. I, I still kind of feel like Luis Diaz plays because I feel, I feel like Diaz plays a lot of games. He's, he's a bit different as a wide option. So I think Diaz probably will start on the left again. But I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't want to call who's going to start between Darwin, Jota and, and Gakpo through the middle. Um, I guess we'll see some um, Europa League on Thursday, so we we might start to see some minutes for the like, so Jota and um, Trent, even Allison. So I think by the time Double Gaming Thirty Four comes around, that does shake things up a bit. Like as a Bradley and Salah owner, I'm kind of looking at that. Like I probably only have one Double Game Week player from Liverpool, and actually, like I'm not gonna sell Bradley, so he might end up being like my first bench because I don't expect him to start both. And I think yeah, like J Jota, I think he's someone that if you saw him get enough minutes, right, across Europe and the league in 33. He'd be my, like, number one target on free hit. Oh, he's he's a right player for you next week. If you've got a, free, a midfield transfer to make next week with the wild card coming the week after, he's, like, the ideal double game week player, isn't he, to bring in? With, he just excites me. I've, I've seen him yeah. slap up my own team live enough times. Like, um, he's just, like, I think he's the one of the best like headers of the ball in the entire Premier League and I just can't quite comprehend how but um but he is um but Tricky's question is what about Jota return so I think at the moment he's very much a punt obviously not having seen him actually get minutes and see if there's no setbacks but I, I, I just feel that I can't see how he wouldn't play I know it's difficult to see one of Darwin or Diaz not starting a game but as we enter this final run in people are going to have to rotate in and out. Like, Rodri's come out with a BBC article earlier that says, I am tired. I will be taking a break during the busy running. Like, that's the fucking article. Like, if Rodri's saying <laughs> that, like, then we've got to just accept that there's going to be a lot more rotation than maybe we think. But yeah, I, 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 I do think that is also what kind of partly puts me off Diaz. I know you're saying, like, maybe focus on um, Liverpool attacking transfers, not defensive ones. But, um, that's the one thing that scares me. It's like, I just, I don't know if I could now go knowingly buy Darwin or Diaz with Jota's return. I've got the... I think problem. you can, because you've got a wild card. I think for people like me and maybe other people are listening now, that if you bring a Liverpool player in, you're probably not going to want to sell them again. So buying Jota now for like six, seven game weeks feels a big risk. In your case, buying him for two... It's probably okay. The, the option people got if people are using Sun again as the as the, the sell player in this process, you could easily go Sun to Jota and then back to Sun again in like AE 35 or 36 and like, like player A to player B back to player A. I don't mind that so much. Mm -hmm. Come back into the philosophy, right? About being there and brave. If you really feel like Jota's the player you want for whatever reason, nostalgia because you really rate him. Um, I don't see the harm in getting it because he is a high upside player. I just think his minutes are far too risky for, for now for, for what I want. Um, but that, that's fair. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to pull up chat sports comment. Fans don't realise how crucial Jota is. Jota would have finished United off. Um, yeah, I have no doubt about that. I think Jota is incredible. Like I, I, I loved him ever since he was at Wolves. I thought it was a fantastic signing when he came. And yeah, I just think it's been really tough for Liverpool this season. They've had a lot of injuries. I, I, I can't fathom how well they've done in all these times with all these different players out to be where they are competing for the very title itself. Um, it kind of scares me. Trossard, Nima, would you say? Pardon? Would, would I compare Jota to Trossard? Yeah. 
I would say Trossard is capable of being fit a lot more than Jota is. He just can't get into the starting eleven, And I almost feel that's by design. I've always felt that whenever I see Trossard come off the bench, he's like, it's so great for us. And when he starts games, I'm not sure personally, it's just my opinion. I don't think he looks as good as when he comes off the bench for us. So I see him as like our 12th man. And like, he's the first guy I want on because he scores critical goals. He's got his calm, cool, collected in the final moments. I would maybe say Trossard's the best finisher at Arsenal. Out of every so player we have. Yeah, so I do see the similarities, but I just feel Jota is like he walks into that starting eleven with authority, whereas with Trossard, I don't know if it's by design or not, but I do feel he plays better coming off the bench, which then would mean that I have to say I think I like Jota more still. As much yeah. as I love Trossard and he scored very important equalizers and goals to get us ahead in all the major games this season and like, I think he's been unreal. Like, when you think he's got nearly 30 goal contributions since coming, like, a season and a half ago, and mostly off the bench, it's pretty, like, he's as good as it gets from an impact sub point of view for me. But um, I think I like Jota. Let's keep going, um, and we will talk more about some of these players later. I've started your question, FPLK9. Good to see you, buddy. So the next one is West Ham versus Fulham. Would you buy a West Ham player for this game? So we've got a 1.6 net XG for West Ham. Fulham 1.65. It's very even. I saw somebody talking about looking at buying like kudus for one week as a part. Like, is there is, is there any part of this fixture you want to have? Like, or or is it just like if you have you play them and if you don't, like just stay far away? <laughs> They've got Leverkusen on Thursday, right? West Ham. That's obviously a big game for them. I'm not sure exactly the extent of what Bowen's done, but I don't know how long he's likely to be out for, how many games he's going to be missed with be a miraculous return. Obviously, not having him, I'm, I'm going to assume that he's out of this game. I don't know if but I'm going to assume he's not going to be fit for this. There will be more emphasis on Kudus to sort of create a moment out of nothing. So, again, I don't hate the move. Um, Fulham. Quite unpredictable. I feel like one week they're really good, and the next week they're not so good. When I feel like with Fulham, when I expect them to get a result, they don't. When I don't expect them to get a result, they do. So I find it quite hard to, like, probably the hardest thing in the league to try and predict because I never seem to get it right with them. Um, yeah, I, I don't hate Fulham as, as, as someone to bring in, but something tells me there's five better attackers than him. Um, at the moment, if, if you're going to make a, a midfield punt for one game week around that sort of price, I'd probably rather punt in wait or something for a week rather than rather than kudos. Fair enough. How do, how do you think tactically? I guess that as you say, they're playing Leverkusen. That's going to be a pretty intense game. Like Leverkusen are undefeated across all competitions and could clinch the title on Sunday. I think when they play, and like that is unheard of to win the league that early in a place where like Bayern have won it twelve years or something in a row. So. That in itself is mental. Do you think Leverkusen might have one eye towards that game, or is it just that like it's so guaranteed they've won that league that now they're like, oh fuck it, let's uh let's protect our undefeated record in Europe? I just think West. Well, the thing with West Ham makes them slightly awkward. They do play in quite a distinct style that obviously clearly works for them, and it might be different to what Leverkusen generally encounter in Germany. So I think West Ham do have that capability of catching the team by surprise with the way they play. I didn't expect them to beat Fiorentina in the final last year, thinking that the sort of passing style of all these Fiorentina players would be too much. I was shocked. Yeah, I was shocked when they went ahead. I was like, what? <laughs> like, what, what, what? How does this make sense? <laughs> so, so could Leverkusen have all the ball, the dominance, West Ham defend the box well, and then boot one forward and Antonio bullies a defender and gets in behind and scores. It, it could happen, but right? this is the sort of thing West Ham can do. Kudus might do it sort of half the pitch dribble why Antonio he might bully his way through or something. Suchek might get on the end of three corners and score two Do you think that West Ham will like almost, I guess as Coim says, will Moyes rest some of his players in this fixture in the Premier League in focus for obviously yeah. like going further the, the, in Europe? Yeah, Europe's got to be the priority. Let's see what happens on Thursday because it might be at the time. Thursday. We don't have to yeah, imagine, yeah, imagine it's like four or five nil first leg. <laughs> right, the ones against Roma, right? Lost the time in the first leg. If, we, if West Ham do that against Leverkusen, then then the priority will be back on this game. But if they're one goal down or something after the first leg, then we could see uh, some rotation for West Ham. I, I generally don't advocate buying West Ham players at the best of time, but I certainly couldn't advocate doing it at this, at this moment. They've got a double lead, have they? If I'm right. No, no. I'm also looking on a uh, Premier injuries real quick because. It still shows um, Ariola with no 
return date, like no update. And as I mentioned, like if I didn't make a midfield move, if I didn't sell like a Sun or Foden this week, I think my only other realistic move I could make is to get a goalkeeper that plays a double in 34 and get them in one week early for Ariola. And I'm just having a look like, is like, where's Ariola at? Because in my original plan, I was actually going to play Ariola in this fixture instead of Dubravka. And obviously with Ariola not an option, I'm kind of being forced to play Dubravka. Um, I'm having a very quick look. So Who's he got next week? Ari- Dubravka. Um, so let me tell you. So Dubravka has Crystal Palace next week um, in the double away at Crystal Palace. He had, yeah. Um, Ariola had Fulham home Crystal Palace away as well um, in his next two. But obviously, it doesn't look that Ariola is going to be back at all. So that's my. I, I use it on the attack. I won't make a goalkeeper transfer with the with the. If, if you do, if you had to play to the end of the season, I might think about doing it. But the fact you've got a wild card in two weeks, I don't think I'll be making a goalkeeper. Oh, this does not look good. Yeah, yeah. So they're saying like April fifth, which was five days ago. Um, <laughs> he has a tweak to his groin. We hope it's not going to be too long, but we'll have to wait and see. And yeah, then poten- that. Poten- poten- <laughs> potential return, potential return date twenty seventh of April, based on guess what? Absolutely nothing because yeah. early, we have no idea. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. Okay, cool. So it looks like I have to play the Bravo if I don't make a goalkeeper move this week. So, and then I'd have to play him against Crystal Palace away the following week. So that's something I've got to weigh up: is the Bravo Tottenham home Crystal Palace away? something to roll with for the next two weeks or what do you think of like say henderson in goal for crystal palace how many points extra you like if you paid the bread for twice what are you going to get somewhere between four and eight you might get 10 if you're lucky but really it's going to be very eight. lucky is there, a goalkeeper? is there a goalkeeper that's going to get you like 16 points across the next two game weeks i can't see it that's what i'm looking, looking at, at mm. is there a goalkeeper crystal, Pal- two yeah, two crystal palace can i really buy henderson away at right. anfield like, 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 maybe I can do it and keep him on the bench and then just play him next week. But yeah, I'm starting to see what you mean. These goalkeepers <laughs> do look very high upside for me. Um, I imagine need to be bold, like I said in the philosophy at the beginning of the episode, and just make a definitive call. Maybe I just need to back the Bravka clean sheet and sell Sun. Like, maybe that's what I'm going to do. I'm starting to potentially lean that way. Um, we've got one more, no, two more fixtures. So I'm just going to quickly go to them. And then we're going to go to the Q&A because I think that's probably more useful for everyone in the chat. So the second to last game is Arsenal versus Aston Villa. It's two net XG for Arsenal. Aston Villa is 1.32. I'm not sure, as you said, that it's going to be a very high scoring game from an Arsenal point of view. I, I, I don't, I'm don't. i not convinced of like us scoring three, four goals, anything like that. I do think um, we're going to be quite knackered from the obviously the first leg with Bayern. We've then got to think about Bayern again in the second leg. Hmm, I'm trying to think who I see coming into the 11. I, yeah, there's a few changes I could imagine happening at these two free players. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing here is obviously Douglas Louise's suspension, I would say. And obviously you as a Villa fan, I imagine you could tell us more about how you think that might impact you or what you might do or who might play to make up for his loss with the suspension from the Yellows. But I'd like to think we can win this game, but I think it's going to be quite a cagey game. And I think you'll win easy. Um, our squad, I think people under under appreciate just how many players we've got out at the moment. There's so many, even dating back to like Tyrone Mings and Buendia. I know they've been out of season, but they're still first team players that we haven't got. So both our centre mids are now out. Um, defence is sort of chaos week to week at the moment. So, and we're just always like, I, I, we're not very good defensively at the minute. We obviously shipped four against Man City, um, even without Haaland in the team. Then we had a 15 minutes of wildness against Brentford and let three goals in pretty quickly. Now we're going to have to play, I would say, two naturally quite attacking midfielders against your team, which I don't think is good when you're trying to manage Odegaard and players like that, assuming you play. Now, again, you might be resting, you might play Vieira or Smith Rowe or someone like that in that role. But I think we're going to struggle in, in the base of midfield, unless we've got a young lad, Tim uh, Irregun, but I don't think they'll throw him into a game at the end. But he did. He did um, Play when we rested quite a lot of players last week against Man City. We obviously, I know they rested hard and we rested quite a lot of players. We've I was going to ask you, is that because of the Euro, Europe game? So, do you feel like, is it the idea that if Arsenal, uh, Liverpool, Villa, um, even Man City, right, if these teams go further in Europe, 
it pretty much guarantees that both Tottenham and Villa will get Champions League regardless of league position, right? So it's kind of like, do you see yourselves potentially doing what you did against City against us where you're like, look, Luis is suspended anyway. A bunch of players are injured anyway. Oh, fuck it. We're just going to focus on Neil. Could you see yeah. that happening? The, the Europe's the big one, right? We've genuine chance of winning that. So we've got Neil on Thursday, genuine chance of winning that. We've got a very small available squad at the moment. And even with our best team, are we really realistically going to win at the Etihad? Are we realistically going to win at the Emirates? Obviously, you could, but let's be fair about it. What's the, the chances? 20, 25% at best? Mm. So if you've got a, a small squad to manage through quite a lot of games in, in various competitions, I don't blame the manager for basically just writing off the hardest ones and prioritising the Brentford at home, prioritising the Lille games, prioritising other ones that supposedly look easier on paper. So it's very possible we could roll up to this game and play a very similar team to the Man City game of the week with no Watkins and played the run up front, give minutes to the likes of Zaniolo and Morgan Rogers and... And, don't and say that. You're that. making. You, don't say that. You're giving my hopes up. It's, it might be the last game. This might be the last, game. Be the last <laughs> game I get to go see live at the uh, Emirates this season. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's on Sunday, right? So I'm, I don't know how I feel. I've got Saka and Gabriel at the moment. Um, I guess there was a world in which the midfielder I would bring in this week wouldn't be Diaz because I want to keep an eye on Jota for next week, as you mentioned. So this week, maybe I would just bring in that Arsenal midfielder one week early to get my third Arsenal player. And maybe this is the fixture. Like, we talked about having fun and being daring and bold. Like, I'm going to be there live. And I'm kind of like, wait a second. Yeah, I do. Like, that sounds like the ideal time. Like, my last game of the season, probably live, like bringing in an Arsenal mid and getting a bit more in info on obviously the Liverpool mid that I want longer term. But um, yeah, okay. Based on what you said, I'm positive. Who, who will play? In, in yeah, you're confident because obviously the deadline is the day before the fixture, so you, That's you're the not going to get any line of news. So I think for me, like in the chat, and we'll answer this now as well because BW Split says I'm concerned about Saka rest. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see it. So Nelson got his first start since 2020 in four years, like the other week, and uh, he was fine. But uh, like the level drop between like Saka and his backups in our squad is like different to the drop off in pretty yeah. much any other position. So for me, like he's just gonna play. Like he's just gonna play this game. He's gonna play the net. He's gonna play. What, so we have seven league games plus the one game against Bayern. Let's say we get knocked out. So we have eight cup finals as it stands. And if we get through against Bayern, then we have ten cup finals. If we get knocked out in the semi or eleven cup finals. So every single game now is a cup final. And I think the rotation we saw was that midweek game against Luton and we managed to get our win. I don't think we're going to see rotation of that level again unless it's later, uh, to closer to when the semi-finals are. That would obviously, if we got to the semis, that would add two more fixtures in the midweek. Sorry, that is a reminder me to do my Champions League subs tonight, but um, I've still got 45 <laughs> minutes, I think. So I'll keep snoozing that alarm. But yeah, so for me, it's like, oh I think they're all going to start. Yeah, yeah, no. So I think Havertz will start. I think Odegaard will start. I think Saka will start. The only doubts in my head are Martinelli, Trossard and Jesus for that left wing slot. My other doubt is if Party starts or Jorginho and whether Tommy Yasu, uh, Zinchenko or Kibio. So it's kind of like left back, one of the three CMs, but with the more defensive ones and one of the left wingers. I just don't see anywhere general- else in that team changing. They're the general free rotating spots anyway, aren't they, for us? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I just don't see any yeah. other position changing because now for me, it's like, this is it. This is eight cup finals to go. If we get knocked out versus Bayern, it's only eight cup finals. If we don't, if we get through, it's 10 cup finals, maybe 11 if we get to the final. But every game is a cup final. I just do not see a world in which like, Saka is not going to start every single game. I just wondered because Rice and Saka got a rest the other game. So, so Odegaard's the main... So, so Odegaard's the only person, actually. So he is the one player who didn't get his rest. Yeah. So you are right in that, where I feel like, okay, like even Rice and Saka have had a rest now. So if there was someone, if Smith Rowe was going to get another game, I think if Arteta thought that you were going to... He might keep an eye on you on Thursday night. And if he felt that you might rotate against us, I could see a Smith Rowe or Vieira coming in. Just for that, like we moment. haven't got no midfield, so our midfield mm-hmm. we'll probably have to play McGinn and Tielemans, I think, who are say naturally eights. We're going to have to try and play the sixes, but I don't think we've got unless we play the same young lad, we haven't really got anyone else to play centrally. 
But that kind of puts um, me off then Odegaard because Odegaard was the original midfielder I want to bring in and he's the one out of him and Havertz that I would expect more likely if there was going to be a rest from one of them. I don't see how it's Kai. And the way I'm seeing it is Kai is now like one of the first names on the team sheet. This will come back to bite me, but I feel he's forced himself into that. playing. We've, we've, we've overlooked him so much. One of the best three teams in the league. You've got an out position player playing centre forward and barely anyone owns it. You know, in the uh, last I mean, month, you I know, mean, in the I mean, last one month, I think in the last month or in the seven games or whatever, he's played striker, however many it is, his goal contributions yeah. match like entire full length seasons at Chelsea. So it's like his entire 38 game seasons, he's managed to match those goal contributions in like six, seven matches as striker for Arsenal. It's like, and we've all just been like, oh, yeah, no, no, he's a rotation risk. Jesus is coming back. Oh, he might play midfield. He might be like, oh, he's going to get rotated. He's going to, and I think earlier in the season, you were, we would have been right. And I think we were a bit too slow to adapt to him as an actual genuine FPL pick. And now, like, he's my most exciting punt for game we played. Yeah, I've got, I can't get him more so I've got Raya, Gabriel and Saka. I'm not really prepared to sell any of those three. But for people who have only got two asks for the midfield vacancy, say, you, you'll look back at the end of the season and think, why was I such a dick? You've got, say, the best team in the league, a midfielder playing up front. He plays every game and suddenly we've all ignored it. Doesn't seem to make any sense. To, to and and, and even when the subs happen, right? Like you see it, like the subs happen. Yeah. Jesus came on, goes to centre forward. Havertz just stays on the pitch and moves to left centre mid. But then he still yeah. gets into those centre forward positions because whether yeah, it's, it's whoever, he's like, he's just constantly moving up and down the pitch. He's become very pivotal to um, what we're doing. Um, yeah, I think I've grown to like him a lot more. I, I wasn't really that negative on him to start with, but it is nice to see some output on the goal side, not just kind of. Had, I was defending him based on his work rate and his defensive <laughs> abilities. And like, you know, it's, it, it, there's only so much you can defend someone from the rival fans with those kind of narratives. But we'll go to the last matchup because there are lots of questions in the q and I've already started about 20 questions that we're going to answer. So let's just keep going. So Chelsea versus Everton. Last game on the Monday night. 1.86 net XG for Chelsea. Everton 1.22. Hmm. This... This looks like a standard Chelsea win, but then didn't they just drop points uh, to both Burnley and Sheffield United? Like, shocking stuff. Shocking, shocking stuff. Everton, the number one team in the league for me to upset. I play like last man standing competition. We've got to pick one team to win every week. I never pick any team playing against Everton. If one team is going to cause an upset on me, I'll make life difficult or just be a real frustration. I think it's them. Or any sort of Sean Dice team, really. They just set up to be difficult to, to win against. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the reason why I wouldn't captain Palmer or something, because I just feel like Everton's got the capabilities of keep it being frustrating here. And then the thing with Chelsea, I, I, I'm still not convinced in an attacking sense. They play very well as a team yet. I think you've got Gallagher making deep runs from midfield, you've got Jackson up there, you've got Palmer. But I almost feel like they're all out for themselves. And because one doesn't pass the other one with the ball, then the next time they come forward, it's the other way around. That person won't pass to the other one again. So Have you seen the penalties as well? Like, it, it, it's, it's, it's completely apparent in the penalty situation. Like, when they got that second penalty, and I think uh, Palmer was dead taken, like, you got Madueke coming and asking to take it. You got the other week when Sterling took it from him and missed. Like, I'm just looking at them like, yeah, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Like, he is scoring every penalty. He's He's ice cold right he's cold 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 farmer and these fucking guys are coming out here begging for the penalty of him and then they're like missing it and shit and they're okay, having to get away by well. their teammates it's just good and weapon, good they'll, they'll win penalties they're tricky they're pacey they're going but they the want the penalty because they're like oh i want it like let me get a goal i need <laughs> stat pad i'm like what the fuck i think about the team dude <laughs> I think he's got it in the moment, Palmer, though. That he, I think he's put it upon himself. He's like the main attacking player, so he feels a responsibility to do stuff. So when he gets the ball around the box, he's looking to shoot rather than slip a ball to, through to Jackson or something. Jackson makes loads of runs and then doesn't get past the ball. So when he gets the ball, we can come and have a shot. He, come up he the refuses ball. to pass it back. <laughs> <laughs> then you've got Gallagher oh. constantly busting the gut to get in the box, make all these third man runs. Yeah, get yeah Gallagher's like killing himself on that pitch, like doing a proper cap performance again no like when they find him he gets a goal but <laughs> they're all busting a gut and like there's just no one there had to pass the fucking ball yeah, everyone's um, refusing to pass so it makes him quite awkward so i think chelsea will get lots of chances and in certain games they'll score lots of goals because it will click people's shots will go in people will be a bit less selfish 
Um, so what do you feel about it? Because got... obviously they look like it's. It seems like this is the upset game, as you say. The next game is Arsenal. So I know Palmer's got very high ownership, but if there was no other player you wanted to sell in your front eight, is he an option to get to a more exciting double game week midfielder one week early now? Like, or do you just feel that like he's like a you sell him no, one time one week no. only? <laughs> I, I think stats wise, he's had the most big chances amongst any midfielder across the last sort of eight weeks or something. Obviously, penalties are included in that, but still, uh, his, his numbers are just too good, Cole Palmer. You, you can't. I think next week will be a decision for those with no bench boost because on paper, he'll probably be the, the weakest eight attacker for a lot of people. And he'll be competing against double game league players. Would you rather have Esney with a double or Cole Palmer playing at the Emirates? It's, there'll be a good test next week, I think, for managers, just how sort of attached they are to Palmer. I don't want to put people off playing at the Emirates, by the way. What about the defenders, game. by the way? Yeah, what do you feel about... So, like, obviously, like, there was a big pylon on Petrovic, Gusto. Um, I know he missed out a game recently, but do, do you feel Gusto safe from an imminent Reece James return? Because Reece James was coming back, and then the quotes a few weeks ago were like, we don't know if we'll even see him this season. So that okay. kind of tells me Gusto is probably okay. And then Petrovic, could he lose his spot to Kepa? That's a Sanchez. Okay, um, Sanchez. I'm just thinking of all, <laughs> the amount of goalkeepers these guys have signed, and oh man, but and every single one has been sold off. Eventually. I don't think he will, but if I had to, obviously Chelsea got these extra pictures, but I might rather have two attackers. I think Gusto at his price, I think, is a bit of a no brainer. A lot of people are obviously sat with him and Bradley and stuff. I've rather, I think of all the chief defenders, Gusto is the one to keep, and I think like, you have you obviously have Palmer. And then the third Chelsea mm. spot, I think you could, Bexie, you could have Jackson. So I wouldn't put people off punting on them with Drew Cole and Madawefe for a run of games even. I, I think they'll play enough now until the end. So I'm just looking at um, their fixtures. Yeah, so they have Aston Villa away, Spurs home for the double in 35, West Ham home in 36, two away fixtures for the double in 37, uh, Forest and Brighton, and then Bournemouth home. Yeah, like... So, so this is it's not two defenders, defenders, right? It's not two defenders. It's two attackers. If you're going that's to two attackers. Yeah, defenders. you know what? I would yeah. not want to go near their defenders for that. Like, um, obviously, a lot of people, including me, when I've looked at wild card drafts for 35, I've kind of this bloody fantasy UCL is going to be the death of me. Um, <laughs> when um, I've looked at my game of 35, I see a lot of drafts where like there's no Arsenal players, no Liverpool players, both teams going for a title. Uh, piled in on Spurs with the doubles, Chelsea with the doubles, obviously tougher fixtures potentially. Um, are we losing the plot here? Like not having players from the top three teams going in yeah. a three-way title challenge just to fit in like an, another second attacker from Chelsea or a second attacker from Spurs. Like I'm at the point where I'm now debating, do I just go for Sun plus one defender or like Sun plus Brennan Johnson and like just don't get a third Spurs player on that wild card, for example? I would only have Sun on my wild card, I think, if I... When Tottenham, I, I, I've seen a few sort of content creators posting sort of what they expect their team to be on a wild card soon or just in regular transfers. There's people who are like no Arsenal players. I'm thinking, like, are you mad? They're like the, the best defensive team in the league. They're playing for the title. The fixtures aren't bad. I, I'd still be more than happy to have two or three Arsenal players that are running. I, I'd be having at least two, I think, for the wild card at the end, even though there's no doubles left. Um, like Chelsea, I think there's, I think Gusto and, and Palmer are good. I wouldn't be against punting the third one. Tottenham, who would you rather have? Like, Middlewesley or Brennan Johnson for the, for the running? Not, not an easy choice, right? I yeah, yeah. Tough. That's really tough because um, I prefer Brennan Johnson as he is currently, but I think I prefer Middlewesley's fixtures. And he's probably got more secure minutes right now. Brennan Johnson's obviously yeah. rotation with Kulisevsky and Richarlison might be back and that might have an impact on attacking spots and things mm. like that. I think this Maduweke does stuff seem exciting. Maduweke does seem exciting, though. Yeah. If you've seen, I know it's very Sorry, different, then... but, you know, on the 21, he's, he's massively involved. It scores like loads of goals, loads of assists. Maybe hasn't quite delivered for Chelsea in the same way yet, but he's going to be a big player, I think, in FPL in like, the next one or two years. Probably one to keep an eye on for next season, I think, Jim. For sure. Let's um let's go to the Q&A, because we're, we're done with all the matchups, but we have quite a lot of questions. Um. So I'm just going to, before we do that, just give a couple of thank yous to all the haulers, all our YouTube members and Patreon. So Super Haulers, FPL, Robbie, Greenback, Golf, Harbour Boy, David Harrison, FPL Discomfort and True Fandela. Thank you for all your support, guys. Our haulers on YouTube, Dread FPL, Podner, Kevin Rose, Sea Hunt, Blonde, Escottism, FPL Teacher, Doni, Tom Gorsuch, Davindra Raj, Lindsay O, FPL DG Boy, Akshay, Dom, Claire, Tursks, Catherine A, Harry Not Kane, Sebastian Koo, Neil, 
Benjamin Lockwood, FPL Rubber Ducky, Big Mike, General Zod, FPL Planner, Mark Bond, FPL Eric Grady, Parag, Jasker and Singh, BW Splitter, our Patreons, Lucy and Gan, Elron, uh, FPL California, Mike Burke, Gunk, Dr. Green Farm, Michael Rodriguez and Daddy Bot. Thank you all for your support and for keeping us going as we fight through to the run-in for the end of the season. We will be announcing more on the schedule as we go. We, we planned out actually just earlier today all the different matchup shows from game week 34 through to 38. And it's going to be a real mix of myself, Craig, um, Kieran, which is at FPL Discomfort, and also Gabriel at FPL Lens. So hopefully we can get all four of us for the game week 38 one. I think that would be quite fun. But um, yeah, there's definitely lots of good stuff to look forward to. And yeah, thank you everyone who subscribed. Thank you to all your support that we are still going. This is our fourth season, third full season, and uh, we're still here, baby. And it uh, wouldn't be possible without all of you. So thank you so much for your support, guys. Um, always want to make sure you get the love. Um, but yeah, let's go to the Q&A, really. So um, I think I'll start with this two questions from the Discord. So let me just start there, actually, because uh, one second. So one minute 36. So one minute 35, 30 is the timestamp for the Q&A in case you weren't here for the whole show and you just want to get your question answered to come back to. I've put it in the details. I have two questions from Discord that we'll take and then we'll take another like, 20 or so that we have in um, in the live chat from today's show. So Dom Black Dragon asks, game week 33 and 34, should we get rid of Haaland? Is Darwin a good replacement? I'm going to say no. no. Um yeah, I, I'm not going to be doing that. So I think we both say no there. What about just in general about Darwin? Is he a good use of the Liverpool spot going into this double, in your opinion? Uh, I think the third spot is Flitzy. I think you, you have Salah. I think he's still, despite the fact he was a bit off it, I thought against Man United, I still think he's their most reliable attacker. I could see an argument for a defender. Um, Van Dijk or maybe even Robertson. For someone like you, um, Nima, with a wild card coming up, I quite like him as a two week punt. Andy Robertson, if you can afford him. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third spot, I think, is open between Jota, between Darwin, between Diaz, even Alexis McAllister's obviously been getting a few more goal involvements and stuff lately as well. So I don't think he's a bad choice. Um, I wouldn't make it, I'd rather have Savanki. I think he'd be, would be my. Of the doubling strikers in 34, I think he'd, if I didn't own him, he'd be the one I'd be keenest to, to bring in. Uh, in the short term yeah i sent you a message by the way um i think you might laugh <laughs> at that one but um so sebastian ku asks um, and we're gonna go quick fire now before i explode but uh, sebastian ku asks could we get rid of Haaland given his poor form for game week 33 so i think we we said no i i, I wouldn't i think i wouldn't even look at his form uh going into the title running I, i'm not concerned personally but obviously go with your gut his second question is i'm targeting to get havertz could I sell Sun to Havertz in game week 33? One fixture versus three fixtures between the two of them. Yeah. I, 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 I think so. And I think that that is potentially my move rather than bloody getting in Henderson for away at Anfield. Yeah, I think I might be joining you on that move, Sebastian. Um, and just pray the Brafka keeps a clean sheet to not punish me for selling Sun. Um, I got to back the three fixtures over one there myself as a Sky player. It's kind of just I got to play three for one. Like that is the way. BW splitter. Free hit 34 and bench boost 37. I'm planning a possible bench boost 35. I have one free transfer to use this week. Ariola to Onana, and then Onana sits on the bench this week. Or Saka to Gordon. Gasp. The latter will let me do Mooney's to Haaland instead of Tony to Haaland in 35. So, okay. And no wild card remaining. So no wild card. Either bench boost 35 or 37 with a free hit in 34. So it needs players that will either be on the bench boost in 35 or 37. Let's get the fixtures up for this, actually. Real I would sell Saka. Yeah, I was going to say Saka to Gordon. No. So, you, so you can fund Muniz to Haaland instead of Tony to Haaland. I, I, I think I would just do the uh, Tony to Haaland. Yeah, same. Yeah, so don't... Yeah, that, that, that's what I think. So let's go to the questions here. Um, so yeah, you're seeing me bouncing along through the show. I'm... I'm I'm literally going to die. Uh, Danish says, I'm 42K. I want to break into the top 10K. Is that possible? He's 37 points yeah. off with wildcard and Metro slept. I think it is possible. Yeah, it's definitely, possible. Possible. definitely possible, mate. Danish asks, should I sell Sun for Diaz? No free hit 34, wildcard 35. Go for it. I think, yeah, Liverpool or Arsenal mid for Sun this week and then wildcarding Sun back in. That's my plan. 
uh, comb asks, I was looking to at Sun to Foden. I, th I think we, we've got to avoid that one for now, unless you hear news that he's starting. Or Odegaard Havertz, but maybe I'll just do Ariola to Henderson. No, I think I still prefer yeah. I still prefer Sun to any of those three players than Ariola to Henderson, in my opinion. Comb. Ask me again on Friday, though, in case things change. Brighton is on the beach, right? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, we think so. Is everyone captaining Holland? They might say they're not at the moment, but I think it will be like a 140, 150% EO personally. Um, Gareth asks, no Haaland at the moment. In fact, no City. Oh, so he, we already answered this earlier. It'll be madness to not get him. Yeah, I think you should get him on your plan, Gareth. Ujan says, should I not sell Solanke then? This was based on like, the matchup we discussed for um, Solanke. Um, he, he'd plan Solanke to whistle as a cheeky move. I would not do that this week. Bowen out. I, I assume chat's bought means to sell him. If so, why not? If you mean oh, is he out? I, I don't know how sort of widespread the news is that he's injured. I, 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 sure, I saw that he was injured. That's what I was going to ask. Is he saying, should I sell Bowen? Or is he saying, but he's Bowen out, like out injured? <laughs> While you look at that, uh, Podna, anyone <laughs> bold enough to captain Watkins? Well, I guess you're the Villa fan, so we'll ask you. Not this week. <laughs> not this week. Playing <laughs> against the best defence in the league, right? What would you do that for? I think he is also trying to wind me up a bit, but it's all <laughs> okay. We, we, we all love each other. So Claire says, I only have Gabriel and Saka. Is it not worth downgrading Saka to Havertz to free up funds? Um, I would say no, unless you actually know what the funds are going towards. If, if like, have a look, see what you can do with the extra funds you free up. And if there is a genuine improvement you can make, like buying a Van Dyke instead of like a Bradley or Canate, then sure. But if you're not going to do anything with the money and it's going to sit in your bank, then I, I see no reason to free up that money personally. The, um, um, just quickly, the Athletic are reporting that Bowen's definitely out of the first leg against Leverkusen. No mention about how long for what the injury is. So it's one to monitor if people have got Bowen here, but he's not going to play Thursday. Fair injury. enough. So keep an eye out if, if you own him and he's not going to be ready for the weekend, maybe a sell. FPL discomfort. If you were wildcarding in 35 and didn't own Saka yet, would you get him or Kai? I'd get Havertz. I'd get Havertz. I'd get Havertz. Um, Richard Dixon, I'm thinking of Wildcard 34, and then one more bench boost chip. I'm 170k to do something different. I mean, this would just be what asking everyone what they're doing with the chip strategies. Um, I think you could still potentially make 100k. I was around where you were last season. I, I didn't quite, it didn't go for me, but you, you could potentially make it. Uh, and that's not going to work, I don't think, because the teams for the bench boost in 37 aren't the ones who double in 34. So if you're going to wildcard 34, you're going to obviously pick players with double in 34 who are no yeah, use so in 37. Mm, so that's probably not a good It's not strategy. worth it. No, I think, like, obviously, if you're wildcard in 34, like, you're going to end up with no doublers from 35 and 37. So it's a bit of a risk with that plan. I think if you can try to somehow salvage wildcard 35 and bench boost 37 and maybe get, I'd say if you've got, six players or five players from Arsenal Liverpool and then maybe two to three players from Wolves and Palace, I would go into the double game with that. If, if you want to be like, different, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be different in the strategy. I think that's the sound strategy now if you've still got your wild card left. I'd probably just be different in the, in what players to pick. There's obviously mm -hmm. loads of teams with double. Don't pick the obvious ones. I'd, I'd rather be different in that way rather than trying to be different for the sake of it with the, with the strategy. Makes sense. Um, BW Splitter, thoughts on Petrovic Sanchez. I have Petrovic and might be true. I think keep an eye out. I, I, I don't know if Sanchez. I don't think Sanchez is going to come back in. I think they're looking to buy another goalkeeper again next summer. So Sanchez is probably getting sold. Um, Donish, should I sell Sun for Diaz? No free hit. I'm on wild card. Yes, I would do that. And then FPL K9, two free transfers, free hit 34, bench boost 37. So this is their current team. Madison, Salah, Saka, Palmer, Sun, Muniz, Solanke, Isaac. I don't know what to do. Double Arsenal plus Gusto plus Doughty plus Reg out of ideas. So two free transfers. I think in your boat, we've all said, like, I'm looking at, like, Sun to anyone who's got a double game week. Mad Madison goes there for, as one. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, if you've got Maddo, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I'd do Madison to Havertz in your team and just roll the second transfer for next week. That's well, he, well he can't. He's got, he's got two free transfers and he's free hitting. But that, that would be... Uh, oh, he can't roll regardless. Transfer. So he has to kind of use both to set up for the post-free hit team. Well, no, but he's going to wild card after that anyway. So it's like yeah. either way, you're burning that transfer in some shape or form. Yeah, I think. Maybe I just... See, I the team was, get, get, get Madison out and get Solanke in. And maybe get the double game with goalkeeper, even if you bench them this week. Just get them for next week before you wild card out. Oh, no, you're free hitting this week. Oh, my God. Okay, fine. All right, all right. <laughs> Just think if we missed any questions, uh, what do we have? So, 
say hmm let me see bw spitz says oh no i think we did cover bw spitz's question okay fine okay cool yeah we've answered everything thank you everybody for tuning in it's been a pleasure thank you as always for joining us craig um you can find craig on x or twitter whatever you like to call it on at man on pod underscore craig i'm of course fpl nima it's been a pleasure to be back we'll be back sometime next week we will let you know it should likely be um gabriel fpl lens back with either craig or kieran depending on what day it is we'll announce that soon thank you all for tuning in enjoy the champions league tonight i'm gonna run to do my sub and yeah thank, thank you everyone see you next week see you next time peace out take care